You know what? It's about time I got to the killer snowman movie. How is it I've dressed like a snowman on this show before even getting to the 1997 Jack Frost flick? And hell, why not? I'll even talk about the sequel, too. Yes, we all know the story of the serial killer who is reincarnated into a killer snowman. Part of the genre of, look, the killer has to become something after he dies. Of course, we mainly know of this film from the eye-catching VHS cover on the new release rack in the late 90s. The one with that sweet lenticular cover that made you think, I'll watch this one for Christmas and save the Uncle Sam movie for the 4th of July. The movie is written and directed by Michael Cooney, who had the idea for the film all the way back in 1989. Cooney really only directed the film because the budget was so small, they couldn't hire someone else to direct. He also co-wrote the thriller Identity, and has joked that the budget of this movie was merely the catering budget on Identity. Though at one point it was considered to have a higher budget, with Rennie Harlan in talks to direct, but never mind that. Shoot this on a small budget, and give the bigger budget to that much creepier 1998 Jack Frost movie. Though this one is still bigger budgeted than that recent Jack Frost movie I saw. And it starts out a little creepier too. Tell me a story. No, it's late. No, I want a story. Please. Yes, listen to the possessed child who wants a story. It's the right person telling it. Michael Cooney is doing the narration. He knows which story to tell. The credits are all on the ornaments. Might as well tell the child the story of a killer snowman. He'd stick knives in their faces and cut out their tummies and stamp on their heads till their brains got all runny. Yeah, look, kid, you're either getting this story or Borgnine's gonna come in and tell you a scary monkey story. While we're gonna get the backstory more than once here, it is pretty funny narration, which catches us up on the drivers taking convicted serial killer Jack Frost to his execution before they stop off and leave some toys for the orphanage, of course. Jack Frost is played by Scott McDonald with some familiar lines. Say, pal, I've got a smoke. Just like in Assault on Precinct 13, if Napoleon Wilson turned into a snowman before helping to save the precinct. Oh, and the name of the town is Snowmanton. See, you're just asking for a killer snowman to show up. Now I wish the killing tree took place in Killer Christmas Treesburg. It'll be very easy for him to escape because, damn it, can you give me some space here? I'm trying to drive! It's very science-based, people. You get a killer named Jack Frost in a truck that crashes into another truck containing chemicals, it only makes sense he will become a snowman, like when Richard Kimball survived a wreck and turned into a train. The movie doesn't go the Rob Zombie Halloween 2 route of having him say fuck for five minutes, but they do what they can with the budget. This is gonna hurt. That'll work itself out. Enjoy the animated sequence before we get to Sheriff Sam haunted with flashbacks of capturing Jack back when Jack was out wig shopping. Uh, wait a minute, the late Christopher Allport? He was Nikki the gay best friend in Savage Weekend. Going back to some old snob episodes there. Also, Scott McDonald is making the most of his screen time here. Because the next time you see it, it's going to tear your world apart. I'll find a way. You know your words still cut deep. I hope they're on their way to see the execution because they brought the kid with them. It's an early Christmas present. No need for the sheriff to be at the crime scene. Looks like they skipped the execution and went right to breakfast. Who's Jack Frost? <sighs> Jack Frost was a very bad man, honey, but now he's gone. Oof. Well, it was summed up enough in the opening credits. Given the plot and silly sound effects in the oat cooking scene, I'm thinking they went into this knowing it was a comedy. Though I do feel bad about the weather, it was actually unseasonably warm when they shot this movie, so they had to resort to creating a lot of fake snow sometimes. That ain't gonna stop the winter decoration contest and awkward small talk. What's the difference between... Snowmen and snowwomen. Okay. I'll see you, Tommy. It's snowballs. He was later executed for unlicensed bad jokes. Even here, Scott McDonald comes in to steal the scene. I heard about uh, Jack Frost. End of an era. Oh, my no way! Tammy, okay?
That was quite a loud flashback you had there. And with Shannon Elizabeth, here is Jill in her first film role. It does make it a good double feature with Scary Movie. There's little things here that are funny, like when Sam throws away the oats that his son made for him, and then this voiceover happens. But Daddy, I made those oats special for you. Ugh, fine. What's another day of food poisoning? Or when he gets to the station. What's the matter? Did somebody die? This movie isn't being very respectful to the passing of old man Harper. If anyone will know what's going on, it's this guy. Look, he has a holster and a black turtleneck. That means he knows things. And his name is literally Agent Manners. They did a damn good job with some of the makeup, too. And the camera work isn't lazy. They're not just pointing and shooting. The movie was shot by Dean Lent. And yeah, sure, he was DP on Gas Food Lodging, but also Class of 1999 to The Substitute. Now that's what I'm talking about. Oh good, finally some people are upset about the death of old man Harper. But you guys running around here like a bunch of vigilantes isn't gonna make my job any easier. But they've already settled on their slogan, Evil Melts Tonight! Also, I've decided that with the flirting of the deputy and the receptionist, this is, in fact, set in Twin Peaks. Jack is almost at full strength. All he needed to continue was for someone to put a face and some buttons on him. Hey, movie! I said movie! Are you deaf as well as butt ugly? Also, for bullies to show up so he can kill them. You could have said the snowman was the reincarnated Billy of Silent Night, Deadly Night, and it would work. Both love decapitating, sledding bullies. The angry parents are sure that it's the sheriff's son who is the murderer, on account of possibly being possessed by Satan. But the Scott McDonald voiceover will assure us it's the snowman. I'll find a way! I'll find a way! I'll kill you in your home! I thought you destroyed those. What are you doing? You're throwing away Sideshow Bob's letters! I love grieving dad whose son was just decapitated and no one cares. And where in God's name you think you're prowling off to like some lady of the night? Our grief isn't good enough for you? Uh, dad, do you mind? I know my brother died, but I got a hot date. Serves them right for not being cautious of the snowman who looks an awful lot like a guy in a suit. But you know what, though? The suit works. It's not a CGI monstrosity, and the movie already has a good enough sense of humor that I can go along with this, even with the puns. Gosh, I only axed you for a smoke. <laughs> That's still better than you demand, Dad. No, I just snowman. Although, how'd he get indoors? Oh, it's okay, because he can change sizes and melt and respawn sometimes, I think. It's all on the warning labels. Plus, I've seen several Christmas horror movies this year that do tree decoration deaths, and this one from 1997 puts all of them to shame. The biggest tragedy here, though, they gotta find Jill and tell her that now her parents are dead, too. It's really gonna put a damper on her hot date. Luckily, they've got the FBI in town. Major Manners. FBI? Sure, why not? Okay, I believe you. No need to show me a badge. Please continue. I'm buying that you're Ghostbusters more than I'm buying your FBI agents. Again, though, I do like the camera work, especially when it freezes. This town always comes together, like stealing the tree from the people who die. And not letting a serial killer get in the way of town hall festivities. Under the advisement of the local federal officers, I am going to put the town under a 24-hour curfew. Boo! Start dancing to the Charlie Brown theme and then tell us the story of Jesus. This guy has the right idea, killing any snowman in sight. Oh, He'll be fine. And when we come back, some deep Christmas carroting. Your Norwest banks wish you holidays filled with magic and wonder. Now that we're back, oh wait, Tubi is still on a commercial break. Because of course this is on Tubi. There's plenty of Jack Frost movies here to choose from. Okay, now we're back. Get the madman be a hero. Ba -la 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 -la. Mm, take me back to the commercial jingle. 
Wait, never mind. I'll stick around. Something hilarious is bound to happen. <laughs> Snowman can't drive cars! It is very boring in this town when there isn't a killer snowman present, or when the juggling isn't done by Shelly and in 3D. People think that it's the getting killed part that's the worst thing about killer snowmen, but it's actually the home repair bill. I'm surprised the fixing of the spraying faucet action doesn't come with a laugh track. You ought to get these pipes fixed, Mrs. Tyler. <laughs> we ought to fix you, Joe. <laughs> Joe's a freaking loser. These two, however, winners. What better way to get over your dead brother than to sneak into the sheriff's house and bang till the sun comes up? <laughs> Just like the classic song, Baby It's Stupid Outside. I don't know why it's shot like Batman and Robin getting suited up in a Schumacher movie, but I'm glad it is. Honestly, I think Schumacher may have been more subtle. Don't worry, though, she's got plenty of people looking after her. Uh, there he goes. Now we're in business. I'm genuinely curious how they're gonna defeat Jack. He can melt down into puddles, squeeze himself into a freezer, and possess some ice. Then he can punch a man out with his snowy oven mitt hands and go into full-on snowman POV. Oh, and this too. No, no! It's the jokes that fuel his powers. But shit, bro. Boobs and bathing. <laughs> You're gonna electrocute yourself if you keep bathing with that guitar. All you need to know about this scene is death by carroting, where even the filmmakers admit they didn't know exactly what this looked like until they were in the editing room. And the worst part, her goddamn security team didn't do anything to stop it. Perhaps if they had manners, agent manners. What kind of weapons are available to us? Oh, they got a snowplow, that should do. Or a trunk full of men in black weapons. On second thought, I don't want to forget any scene in this film. Then Sam officially finds out the information that Jack has not only turned into a snowman, but he's got Michael Keaton and Martin Short fighting over the film rights. Still no word on how to defeat him, though, but blow dryers will slow him down a bit. Has anyone tried simply writing their name in him in urine? I love that Jack Frost is essentially the T-1000 if played by Burl Ives. I also love that they didn't have to get ambitious with their editing, but... <laughs> This movie was deprived of a Best Cinematography and Best Editing Oscar. Fortunately, I know he's gonna come back because there's still 15 minutes of the movie left. It can't be under 80 minutes. Look, Ma! I'm a Picasso! <laughs> so let's just turn it into Toy Story. I sure hope they use this time to explain the science of Jack Frost. By shooting it out of the man, that'll make his answers sincere. To ensure the survival of our race through a global holocaust, I created an acid that would bond a human chromosome helix. Makes sense. Killer Snowman wants revenge against the sheriff who busted him. Got it. Though with this 2B commercial break placement, I think they're gonna call J.G. Wentworth to get the cash now to destroy the snowman. Then they can have the budget for the climax. Give us the biggest snowball you can find. Oh! Hey, Jack! What? You left the 710 split. Only I make the jokes, you sons of bitches! Sometimes Jack is fairly easy to slow down. The problem before was they simply didn't have enough blow dryers. But putting him in the furnace will make him more powerful, as he'll now start haunting the nightmares of their children. What? He already has one-liners. There's still a lot of time in this movie left, and I don't think that it has 10 minutes of end credits. Is there a way to defeat him? Hellfire just made his steam escape from the furnace to reform, and now he has freaking teeth! Is this movie just making up stuff as it goes along? <laughs> this part's original, though. Maybe turn you back, but I'm having so much fun just the way I am! Wait, wait, wait! Finally, one of these movies where the killer is like, you know, I prefer being the thing that I magically turned into. 
After all, now he can travel around while inside of another man's body until his snow body is vomited up. After that info, of course he can teleport inside the car. If your engine is flooded, that means a snowman can get inside of it. It's getting to the point to where if he is defeated, they're gonna have to work hard at getting me to believe it. Oh, of course, he's hurt by the kid's homemade oats because he put antifreeze in it to keep people who eat it warm. Okay, that's stupid enough for me to buy it in this universe. Sure, the movie got bad reviews when it came out, but you know what? It knows what it is, and it succeeds in its intended goal. The point of a movie like this is to get some good laughs and good kills out of it, and it has both of those things. The movie is genuinely very funny. Times have changed. It's okay for cinema snobs to like Jack Frost now. We're in a world where now it's the snobs knocking directors for putting the classics on their favorites list. Did Citizen Kane have Charles Foster Kane wrestling a snow globe till they fell in a truck of antifreeze? No, that would have been if it was a 70s Orson Welles movie. Then the town rejoiced, or at least about four or five townspeople. It's an early to bed, early to rise kind of place. You can show me him being buried all you want. I know there will be sequel bait. This is a double feature episode. See, it's boiling. That means he's somehow gonna create a Ninja Turtles villain. And that's the end of I Got Exactly What I Paid For. And the box cover ensured that the movie was a hit on video. And then in the year 2000, we got the much-deserved sequel, Jack Frost 2, Revenge of the Mutant Killer Snowman. It's actually important that they specify which Jack Frost. There's a lot of movies called that. We'll be right back after the commercial break. <laughs> Nesty then, mini nesty cool. I am back and I'm already jealous of the snowman suit in these movies. It's way better and less itchy than mine. And mine comes with a suit jacket. This suit looks so impressive, it could easily be featured in a Wood Rocket porn parody if it wanted. After the direct-to-video success of Jack Frost 97, we had to wait three whole years for a sequel? No matter, it still has that lenticular cover. We're gonna rent the hell out of this anytime! And for the record, yes, this is the Mutant Killer Snowman movie, as even the IMDb summary is straightforward to the point of being a smartass. Uh, the Mutant Killer Snowman returns to meet more people during Christmas. Even the Hallmark movies use longer descriptions, and those are just about kissing over hot empty coffee cups to save the local shop from closing. Granted, the reason they used this very specific subtitle is that they really didn't want people to think it was a sequel to the Michael Keaton movie. No, we're not linked to them. That one's way more scary. I could see people being confused, honestly. I worked at a video store where customers were angry because they thought that the Pirates porno was part of the Disney Pirates series. Spoiler, it is. With Jack Frost 2, Michael Cooney returns as writer and director, Scott McDonald is back as Jack Frost, Christopher Allport as Sam, Eileen Seeley as Anne, and most importantly, the Carrot Nose. As we all remember, Jack Frost was defeated by antifreeze, stored in containers, and buried. But what I really want to know is what happened to the dad telling this story to his daughter at the beginning of the first. This one opens with Sam in therapy, talking to the only person he can trust, his favorite Seinfeld character, Mr. Pitt, who isn't having any of this. Jack was nimble. Jack was quick. Jack gouged eyes with candlesticks. I said no ink and no puns. He's looking at this all wrong. It's not traumatic, it's hilarious. I mean, the eavesdropping receptionist thinks it's hilarious. And then there was the accident. <laughs> What's that? Elaine is just on her way to get me the right socks. They all think it's funny. She even brings the village people in to listen to the conversation. He is clearly gonna have his therapy license removed. I'm getting the feeling that a lot of people in this town ain't too bright, and Jack Frost is gonna get dug up somehow. You sure this is the one? Oh, well, you sure there's a reward? Shouldn't have buried him in Mayberry, USA. There goes Gomer digging up killers again. 
But now the scientists finally have the correct formula to see if they can recreate the classic ecto-cooler concoction to put it back out in stores. This opening credit sequence looks like it's entirely made up of B-roll that I would see in some kind of hair regrowth commercial. I'm guessing this guy is also going to do something dumb, he's wearing a stupid hat, or he's going to fall into something and become a comic book villain. Ah, Coffee Man, what are his powers going to be? Hmm, <laughs> the powers of early CGI, makes sense. Oh, and Jack Frost is alive again, melting into pipes like he usually does. The events of the first have essentially made Sam afraid of going outside again. He's even having an anxiety attack just going on vacation. And more characters are back, including voice actress Marsha Clark and also Ass. Since they had warm weather when filming the first, might as well make the sequel in a tropical location. Though they still had weather problems when it rained every day of the shoot. This feels like the kind of place the characters from High School Musical probably worked at for a summer. This scene is pretty funny, where they're pointing out all the lessons these characters are gonna learn. However, what they'll discover is the true meaning of friendship. Isn't that... Also, I'm sure the Saved by the Bell cast is nearby, too. We have to keep watching, though. On this season of White Lotus, we gotta find out what led to being stabbed in the face with a carrot. Also, there's people stranded at sea in this one. John Frankenheimer really changed things in Island of Dr. Moreau when he took over. Jack had to get his carrot nose back somehow. Might as well get it from these two, who are starving and fighting over the last carrot. Somehow this seems even more low budget than the first. One is stabbed with an icicle, while the other, eh, he fell into the water and Jack said a one-liner. That's how you know he got him. However, it's still funny when Jack travels with the tides and simply knows right away our heroes went on vacation for the holidays. There's a helpful bartender, too, who is helping the girls out on who to hook up with. I think that you guys are looking for us behind on number three. Hey. Oh, thanks. We wanted to get roofied in a frat house tonight. I'm starting to figure out how they got this place on a discount. Looks like we have us a party pooper duper. This is a job for Captain Fun. I'm never going on vacation again. Even Jack wants to hang back since the others are doing karaoke. The girls hanging out on the beach will do. So far, it looks like the island is about to be taken over by a killer severed dick who can set booby traps for CGI icicles to fall on her. And if that doesn't work... Do what Wile E. Coyote would do around Christmas. I've given up trying to figure out his powers. Now it's like he simply has the powers of death and final destination, but more smartass. Tongs! I'm so scared! <laughs> I don't know whether to run away or grab the barbecue sauce! <laughs> I hope Scott McDonald didn't know the context for any of this when he read these lines. He'll just assume the snowman finally appears and there will be death by tongs. That's easier to explain than this. Up and out! Captain Fun makes Party Cop look like Detective Steve McGarrett. Now let's take a break while they clean all the flies and carrot bits out of the potato salad. The only one with the unexpected twist of Lyman. <sighs> Hopes your holiday has a little unexpected smile. Welcome back. Is the movie Network TV enough for you yet? All right, all right, nothing to be alarmed about. Oh, whatever it is, I've seen it all before. He takes his Higgins cosplay very seriously. And Agent Manners is back, too, here to Thomas Jane the shit out of this movie. They put an eye patch on him, probably to cover up that this is a different actor playing him. Here he's played by David Allen Brooks, who can get into the mind of a killer. No, he isn't Will Graham, but he was in Manhunter. Maybe being a different actor is why Sam doesn't recognize him right away, and only does when they mention his name. The movie still finds plenty of ways to surprise you. Oh, phone line's dead, huh? Let's see who's next. For instance, he's able to go inside of a snow globe. And knocking the phone lines out by, I don't know, putting part of himself inside of it. 
Unfortunately, the only superhero they can rely on is Captain Fun. Especially when the mystery has been amped up. You would think the killer would be Doug Jones, but he was already killed on the raft earlier. And somehow I keep thinking Agent Manners is now turning into John Hurd over the course of the movie. There are a lot of POV shots in this one. It does make me wonder if they had more limited access to a costume or if it had limited function. This means it'll be just as good as Jaws. He also becomes ice a lot more in this one. Which, if he's in ice cube form, that means he's more than one person now? For some reason, the only unrealistic thing about this sequence to me is how come none of them can hear him talk in the sequel? This is like one of those Coca-Cola commercials where the talking ice cubes love being put in drinks and eaten for some reason. Which, you know, then causes the person to explode when they eat the ice. I still notice the smaller budget. Let's just have the death be shown to us in Polaroids. The important thing is that the cast and crew got a good vacation out of it. Like if Happy Madison made a Jack Frost movie. And I know just the character Rob Schneider would play. He's gonna turn into an animal somehow, isn't he? What it lacks so far in intricate death scenes... You'll love it. ...it makes up for in highly ambitious transition shots. With these costumes, they will surely catch every renegade pot dealer on the island. Finally, someone heard Jack's voice. Should be easy enough. Just do what you did in the first one to defeat him. Get a lot of antifreeze and beat down every Jack Frost mascot in the area, even if you get in trouble. Now, we can't have the guests attacking the staff. It's just not on. Pfft, and you call this a vacation? And now I'm starting to have PTSD about another case from the past. But out on the ground... Sam? No. There was a carrot on the ground. Sam. Oh, God. I know what detective they're gonna bring in. Do you like carrots? In fairness, this was the case he was born to solve. We'll kill some time before he gets here. We gotta get to the most popular scene in the movie. Even if you haven't seen the whole film, you've probably seen this scene somewhere. The part where he puts his mid hand into the pool, which drowns her under a sheet of ice, and the tragic part, this being the last image she sees. What you usually don't see in this clip is the far superior payoff, where again, it's clear they don't have a suit that moves much, so they just have him freeze some beer and whoever the hell this person is. If he has this power, why doesn't he just make the whole island freeze over? That way it'll be really comfortable when you fall asleep under the heavy blankets. Though it's the fact that it's cold in there when they don't have any air conditioning that makes him realize, oh god, the killer snowman is back. See, Jack can sprinkle down fake movie snow. We're all screwed. That doesn't make anyone else on the island worry. It just means they get to have a snowball fight. Woo, this is great, guys. We don't have to go to school tomorrow. Sam is the only one concerned, as there's only one person who can do this, Mr. Freeze. But since he came with a bit too many puns, even for this movie, it has to be Jack Frost. But we can afford to rip off the frozen pole scene from A Christmas Story, and I'm sure it'll play out exactly the same. If the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man came up behind Flick and ripped his tongue out of his head. You can see the spots where they saved up a lot of their effects budget, like the part where he hurls snowballs left and right that are strong enough to knock people's arms off and go through their head. And he's even got some icicles to spare. We still can't show much of the costume, though. Just know he still doesn't kill the one person who can stop him. This is concentrated antifreeze, and I've been wearing it around my neck for a year. Don't ask about the rash that it left on my chest. However, it's pretty funny when he thinks this regular snowman is Jack. That's clearly not him. You gotta look for the one that you could maybe buy at a spirit Halloween. Jack? Ah. Oh, gotta go! Whee! And the one that disappears into the snow. And yet some people still don't believe. I told you, I felt it all along. It can't be Jack. How the hell did he get here? Did he fly first class? Marlo, we don't know, but... Right? That's impossible. It has to be another killer talking snowman. The important thing, though, is that the characters are still relatable. I'll go with you. And I'll... No, 
Joe, you stay here. That's what I was going to say. Joe is the hero that represents all of us. And it is a horror comedy from around this time, so of course they have to put their magic liquid in squirt guns. And they explain that Jack may have found Sam here because their DNA got mixed together due to their tussle at the end of the first. This made more sense when you didn't explain anything. Just show us our heroes behaving like the parents are on vacation and the kids have taken over the house with their forts. Thankfully, there's barrels of antifreeze on the island. <laughs> now it's serious. Wait! Snow Angel! <laughs> Captain Fun's weakness is knowing the time and place. Jack Frost doesn't stand a chance. Look, they're way better at building their forts now. Although I think Jack's weakness here may be that with the cheaper costume, it's much harder to walk around. So naturally, he's gonna fall over into antifreeze any second. Oh, you think it's over? You fools, this movie isn't only 65 minutes long. Let's take a break, and when we come back, he's invincible because he's new and improved somehow. <laughs> Good. Happy holidays from your friends at McDonald's. Welcome back, everyone. Ah! No! That happened. Now let's destroy every snowball in sight, or at least stare at one till we know how evil snowman lore works. Oh, okay. It can hatch, and now there's baby Jack Frosts. Yeah, I'll be your dad, huh? <laughs> you yeah, yeah, will. Who you do? Just like in Prometheus. I'll give it this. The first one was better, but this is still an unpredictable movie. I wasn't expecting a baby snowball that chases them around the room till they put it into a blender, which still doesn't kill it. Because it's the trouble with Tribbles now, except with snow. I'm surprised we couldn't find the baby snowmen in stores. They could have merchandised the hell out of this. You can make them talk, too. Mmm, toaster! You sold out, Jack Frost movies. Maybe you should all just leave the island and accept that this is the evil island of snowmen now. It would save you from doing the stock horror comedy thing where the heroes dress in random shit they find around the house to do a badass shot. I'm very surprised these things didn't become the faces of this particular studio. It could have been to them what the minions are to Illumination. They're just begging for a partnership with Hostess Snowballs. I mean, Tubi did throw in a commercial for the new Fantasy Island. That's bound to have a killer snowball episode, I'm sure. These people are kind of making it easy for them. They look for weird sounds the same way Clark Griswold looks for squirrels in a Christmas tree. This seems like a good enough plan. Suck them into a vacuum and shoot them into a container. Now do that to 300 more of them. This is going to be a really long climax. And somewhere I have the feeling there's a prop maker who still to this day has all of these snowball men props on display in his office. There is something charming about the fact that these movies unapologetically have no rules. They're fully aware they're just making up stuff as they go along. For instance, how are they going to defeat them this time? Well, you see, since Sam and Jack's DNA got mixed up, they remember that Sam is allergic to bananas, which means now the snowmen must also be allergic to them too, so they get all of the bananas they can find to destroy the evil snowmen once and for all. Oh, to be a fly on the wall during the writing session of this movie. Oh, how am I going to write them defeating Jack? I could go for a bottle of 99 bananas. Oh, wait, that's it! Bananas! However, I don't know what the hell he was on when the sad scene was written where one of Jack's kids dies in his arms and he sheds a tear. Don't worry, it'll get hilarious again when the kills continue. And when the costume makes it very easy for them to outrun Jack. Except, you know, when he could turn himself into a box and trap her inside of it. Sure! I have no evidence of this. I just have the feeling that Anne being trapped inside the snowman and then Jack being shot and exploded like a bloodier Ghostbusters, then when he finds his wife inside the goo, somehow this led to the creation of Sharknado. All is well when they can watch a good sequel bait rise in the morning. 
It doesn't really matter what happens here, since there's no more Jack Frost sequels in this movie's universe. As much as I would love to see a Godzilla-type sequel that this alludes to, Originally, there was talks of there being a third, but they decided not to out of respect due to the tragic death of Christopher Allport. Still, these are two fun movies. The first one had the better laughs and the better kills, but the second does pick up in the third act with the introduction of the snowballs. You can see the low budget a lot more in the second, but it is still respectable that they do what they can to still make it an entertaining flick, which it is. And I finally got those two movies out of the way, so now I can go back to doing what I usually do. Dressing like a jackass during the holidays, and pretending I'm more sophisticated than the movie with talking snowmen inside of blenders. Oh, dude, my beer's warm. Bummer.